Let's get started with creating a Python project scaffold. What's important about this setup is that it's a repeatable process that you can do for every new project that you create. Let's suppose there's a GitHub repo and you check it out. In this case, it'll be in the Cloud9 environment, but to any environment, what are the things you need to do to be successful? Well, the first thing is I would recommend creating a makefile. And this make file will hold a series of recipes. Next up, we should create a requirements file. So that'll be the next step here. And it'll be called requirements.txt. Uh, after that, we can create some kind of a script. I'll start with a hello.py file. Also, we can create a test file. So we'll test our code. And then the final uh, bit here would be that inside of this environment here we could create a python virtual environment so really these are the the key components in order to test your code get it set up so that later we can do continuous integration and we can do continuous delivery so let's go ahead and do this in the aws cloud 9 environment let's get started with creating this basic scaffolding for our project the first thing that we'll need to do is create a new git repo so I'm going to go ahead and go to GitHub. I'm going to create a new repo called Scaffold. And then I'll put a description. This is a uh, project scaffold for Python. All right. And then a few things to point out here would be that uh, it's always a good idea to add a readme file and also to add a git ignore file. I'm going to go ahead and select this and select the default Python template. What this does is make sure that irritating files like .pyc files or other files like eggs don't show up inside of your Git repo. They'll automatically um, basically be ignored. Okay, next I'll go ahead and say create repo. Now that I've got that set up, I can go back to my Cloud9 environment. I'm gonna go ahead and select this icon code and I want to select SSH. This will allow me to do encrypted bi-directional communication and I don't have to have a password if I set up SSH keys. So first let me just show you how this would work before I set up the SSH keys. So I'll go ahead and copy this, go back to Cloud9 and I'll type in git clone. Here we go. Notice after it tries to connect it says I can't do it, right? I have no way of connecting to this repo because I never told this environment how to communicate. What I'll need to do then is set up SSH keys. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear the screen and set up SSH keys and give those to my GitHub account. So step one is let's type in SSH hyphen keygen dash T RSA. And notice that it'll put a public and a private key pair in this directory, which is my home directory. Now, what I can do if I scroll up a little bit is you'll, you'll see this public key. That's the key that I want to print out into foreground and then upload to GitHub. So I'll go ahead and run the word cat, which is basically print it out and print out that key. From here, I'll copy this string. And this is not secret. Uh, I can actually put it on a website somewhere if I wanted to, there, but I wanna put this into GitHub. And so I'll go back to GitHub here and I will uh, look at my profile and I'll go to settings. And from here, I'll go to the section called SSH and GPG keys. And then I'll go ahead and create a new SSH key. I'll go ahead and paste it in here and then call this scaffold. All right, it'll ask me for my password. Great, I'll go ahead and uh, log this in. And now if I go back to Cloud9, I should be able to check this out. So notice how if you use the up arrow or down arrow, you don't have to type in a command again. This is a great idea in general. Perfect, we've got this checked out. So we're ready to build out this scaffold. So I'm gonna CD, uh, the CD command is change directory into scaffold, and then I'll run an LS. You notice there's nothing inside of here. So the next thing that I'll do is I'll use this touch command uh, which will create empty files. So what are the files I'll need initially? Well, I wanna make a makefile. So I'll say touch makefile. 
I'll also want a script file, so we'll make one called hello. I'll also want a test file, so I'll say test hello.py. I'll also want a requirements file, requirements.txt. And this is pretty much all I need to get started. Uh, and then from here, what I can do as well is create a Python virtual environment. Again, remember that the Python virtual environment isolates my code to a specific directory. I always like to name whatever the project is that I've, I've created in GitHub the same name as the virtual environment. That way it's easier to remember. So uh, for example, if I type in git remote-v, you can see that the name of my project is called scaffold, right? So let's go ahead and create a, a virtual environment that's in my home directory that's invisible and that way I don't have to accidentally check it in as well. So if we go through here and we type in Python 3 dash M, this stands for module, create a virtual environment or use the virtual environment module and put this in tilde, which is my home directory slash dot scaffold. There we go. So this is a good convention to use so that you never have to remember what it is that you called your virtual environment, just call it the same thing as your Git repo. Okay, now that we've created that, I can source it. And uh, I'll go ahead and do that next. And to source it, I would type in source tilde slash dot scaffold bin activate. And activate is the shell script that activates the environment. Once I do this, if I type in which Python, you can see that it'll be living now in this directory. It'll be living inside of tilde slash dot scaffold bin Python 3. So again, this is a really good best practice so that you don't have all these problems of there's packages that are conflicting with each other or the system Python has problems. So in general, always recommend you do a Python virtual environment. Now that we've got that set up, let's go to step two, which is um, let's look at that make file. And if we look at this make file, uh, we can uh, do a couple things here. First, always make your make file use tabs uh, because make files like tabs. And then uh, what I'll do here is I'll just cut and paste one that I've created earlier uh, that's boilerplate. And what you'll probably find is that you can use the same kind of make files over and over again in your project. So a lot of times it's good to just copy it and change it a little bit from a previous project. Let me walk through what all of these steps are. So the first step is that I would do a pip install dash dash upgrade pip. Pip is the Python packaging tool that's actually included in a virtual environment. Notice if I go here and I say which pip, it'll show that it's actually using the, the Python packaging tool in the virtual environment. So that's yet another reason to use the virtual environment is that you get the greatest version of pips or the, the newest version that's in, installed with that version of Python. I also like to install it though and with an upgrade so that I always get the latest version. And then I use this requirements file to grab whatever packages my project will need. Uh, next, there's a format section here that allows me to format my code using a formatting tool called Python Black. Uh, this is optional, but I like to do it just so that my code is up to standard. Next, there's a lint section, and I use a tool called PyLint, and I tell it to disable two of the warnings that are extra verbose. These are recommended in configuration. What it'll do is it'll only give me then warning and error messages, which is what I really care about. And then I'll tell it to run the lint on this hello.py file. The four, fourth step here is testing. So what I'll do is I'll use the PyTest uh, third-party library, and I'll run python-m pytest, give me some verbose output, give me a little bit of coverage here, and then run this test for this test code. So that's really the basic structure, and I would recommend this structure in every single project that you do. So now that we've got that set up, uh, the next thing we can do is move on to the requirements, which will be the, the packages. So I'm gonna double click this, and then now I can go back and decide what packages I want in my project. So I would recommend uh, probably just a few commands here that, that I typically find or, or libraries that I find in most projects. PyLint, as we discussed, is a popular linting tool. An alternative would be uh, PyFlake or Flake8. Uh, there's also PyTest, which is the testing library. 
There's Click, which is a command line tool library. There's Black, which is the formatting library, and PyTest Cov, which is a coverage tool that shows me how much of my code has got covered. So really these um, five packages, I would recommend probably in all projects, they're, they're generally gonna be useful. I don't pin them and give them a specific number, you know, like a, a particular version at first, but later that could be a good idea if I wanted to specifically call out a very specific version of the library, you could do that right here. But let's go ahead and save this. And now we're ready to go, we can do an installation. So this will be step one. Let's go ahead and say make install. There we go. And then this will go through, look at the requirements file and install those packages as well as upgrading the version of pip if there's an upgrade to be had. And this typically will take, you know, let's say 30 seconds or so, depending on what you've got uh, in your requirements file. Perfect, so that was pretty, pretty quick here. So the next step is let's move on to creating some code. So I'm gonna go to a hello file and from here, a, a good one to start out with, and it's probably not a bad idea to build this scaffolding out for every project, is just something that kind of gets things going. So I'm gonna build a add function that accepts an X and a Y, and what it will do is it will uh, return a, um, an X and a Y, and then I can, I can basically print this out. So I can say print, and I can say, you know, uh, this is the sum and then put in the the uh, and we'll put in um, the X and then we'll put in the Y and then we'll put in the final result which will be the the function that's returned with uh, X and Y there we go perfect so that looks like uh, we'll be able to print this out here and notice that um, it may maybe by default here um, we'll need to be told uh, what the what the x and the y are and so uh, what i can do is put in a x is equal to one and y is equal to two there we go and so this should uh, kind of get things going here and let's go ahead and um, say python hello.py there we go this is the sum one and two notice that um, in this particular example, um, I'm gonna need to maybe get the result first. So let's go ahead and say result is equal to add, and then I also need to change this to plus. And, and so then from here, we can see that X and Y will give us the result. And if to make it a little bit easier, I could actually say result. There we go, perfect. So if I go ahead and I run this, uh, it should go one, two, three. Perfect. So we've got we've got something going here, and I have kind of a basic structure for my code. So now that I've been able to demonstrate that that works, the next thing that I can do is actually get lint working. And so uh, how would I do this? Well, uh, it's already built into the make file, right? It says lint pylint. So I can just say make lint. And if things are successful, uh-oh, it says redefining X from outer scope, redefining Y from outer scope. So I was a little bit naughty here and I have some messy code. So how could we actually fix this uh, if we wanted to you know, make things a little bit easier? Well, what I could do is that um, I could actually change around my code so that Lint wouldn't have a problem with it. So what are the ways that I could do this? Well, one of the ways that we could do this um, is that uh, I could actually say uh, in this particular scenario here, instead of defining X and Y, I could actually do this. I could say this is the sum, and I could do this. I could say one and two, and then uh, this would clean it up because um, I wouldn't specifically put that in there. I would actually put the numbers inside. And now this would be uh, acceptable because I'm not redefining those variables. Let's go ahead and run my make lint here and notice now I cleaned it up. So this is just generally a good way to make sure that you're not making silly mistakes in your code and it checks the syntax without me even needing to write tests. So now that we've got that step up, right? So we've got step one and we've got step two here. Let's actually run this format tool. So I'm gonna say make format and you'll notice what'll happen is it'll clean this up. So if I say make format, there we go. It said, um, 
one file formatted and notice that it made uh, some extra spaces here and it basically just made it look a little bit more pleasant to the eye. So it's an optional step, but I, I find it to be pretty useful. Uh, now let's look at the last step here, which would be to test our code. So in order to do that, I'm gonna need to create a test file. So I'll go ahead and, and um, uh, look at this test file here and say um, from hello, so I'll need to import my other code, import add. Next, I can say, make a, a, a test statement. So I'll say test add. And then uh, it's actually pretty straightforward to test when you're using this PyTest tool. I can assert that two values are what I expect. So I can say, uh, for example, uh, add, which we know will add two numbers together. If I add one and two, that that should equal three, right? Um, and we and I'll need to say assert. I'll need to say assert. So basically, make sure that uh, when I put in one and two in here, that it'll come back with three. So let's go ahead and do this. We'll say make test, and there we go. And I've got 100% test coverage. Now notice if I, um, you know, basically made an incorrect test that it'll go and fail. There we go. We can say that, uh-oh, looks like there's a failure here. You know, four doesn't equal three. So uh, I now have basically a complete setup where I can actually test everything at once. And one other thing you can do with a make file that's kind of neat is if you wanted to, you could actually run an all statement and run several of these commands all at once to really simplify how you would set up a project. So if I said all, I could say, maybe I wanna install this code and then I want to um, lint it and then I wanna test it, right? So if we go ahead and do that, if I say make all, it should run all those at the same time. Perfect. So in a nutshell, this is a, a, a basic setup for a Python scaffolding. We've got everything ready to go locally and we're ready to later set up continuous integration. So the final thing to do would be to push my code to GitHub. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll type in git status. And you'll notice that there's four files here that need to be added. So because I have included that git ignore file, I can actually do this. I can say git add star, and it'll add all four at the same time. And then if I type in git status, you'll see they're now green. So they're ready to be pushed. Now I'll go ahead and um, I'll commit this. So I'll type in git commit, which commits it locally. So adding initial structure. And then uh, notice that it's asking me to do some setup. The first time you set up your project, you'll need to do this configuration either in a file or manually like I'm gonna do it here. So I'll go ahead and put my name and then I'll put in my email address here next. Let's go ahead and do that. So here we go. And the, the main reason for this is so that you get good tracking and you know what's happening in terms of metrics in your project, which is a good idea. So we'll go through here and we'll run this. Perfect. And it opens up to the default editor, which in this case is nano. And I'll type in a control key and then an O to write it out. And then I'll do control X to exit. And then from here, I can push it. And this has been committed locally but when I push, it pushes all of these files to GitHub. So let's go ahead and say git push. And here we go. How do we test this out? Well, I can go back to GitHub. And if I do a refresh, you'll see that all those files are locate, located here. So it's all set up for me to do a cloud-based continuous integration.